Hello, everyone. I'm Christopher Napoli, and I lead our wealth and asset management go-to-market strategy here at Snowflake. We're excited to go through this video for you to highlight our time series capabilities that we have been developing here at Snowflake, and in particular, how they are used in the financial services industry. Before we kick start into the demo, wanted to just highlight that this has been over two and a half years of collaboration between the industry go-to-market team, our product organization, and our field CTO team to develop these assets after listening to the market and understanding truly the pain points that are solved by having time series within the Snowflake capabilities. With that being said, I'd like to turn this over to the product manager for time series, Yogita Chilakari, in order to walk us through what has been developed. Thank you, Chris. So time series data sets can be very large in volume, and we have uh, seen customers use them to make business critical decisions. Uh, we've often heard from customers that they need a performant and cost-effective platform to do these kind of analytics. Uh, they need to efficiently collect, store, and analyze their time series data sets. Uh, and we've introduced several features in the last two, two and a half years that makes working with time series data sets very easy. Uh, I would like to touch upon a few capabilities that we have recently introduced. So we have introduced native time series functions. We can do all of these analytics today earlier with like maybe with you know window functions or window frame functions, but we've heard from customers that it can get cumbersome at times. So we've introduced these native time series functions that makes working with your time series data very easy. Of all of these native functions, I would like to touch upon the as of joins and range between, which went into uh, GA or general availability very recently. So the first one, as of joins. So when working with time series data sets, it's common that the timestamps in the two data sets or two or more data sets that you want to link do not correctly align or they do not exactly match. Uh, this could be because they have come from sources which are very different. They're sending the data, uh, data at a different cadence. So when now you want to link these two or more data sets, we have a common operation which is common in the time series world is to use an as of join. And we've introduced that in Snowflake. What happens in an as of join is for each record on the left side of your table, we find the closest record on the right side of your table based on a proximity condition that you can mention. Um, you can see the syntax uh, right there on your left hand, right? One in SQL and the other one in uh, Python. Um, you can say, for example, here, select whatever condition from your left table as of join the right table, and you can uh, specify the proximity condition as part of the match condition, and your on clause will specify what is your joining key. So this makes joining or proximity-based joins in Snowflake very easy and also performant. The next feature which we have recently uh, introduced is range between. So when working with, again, time series data sets, you'll run into a scenario where there are gaps in your data. This could be because in the stock world, that it's, not, it's a non-trading day or it's a holiday, and there is no data for that uh, day. But you want your analytics to make sure that you know it understands that there is a gap in data and produces the right results. So for example, you're moving statistics, moving averages, moving sums. All of these need to account for these gaps and produce the right results. Customers earlier used to uh, write self joins and make sure that none of the data sets had any kind of gaps so that their results were right. But now you do not need to do any uh, kind of such pre-processing. All you need to do is specify your interval using range between intervals, for example, here, two days preceding and current row to calculate like your, let's say, moving averages or moving sums in that three-day period. So all of this, all of these features are available in GA today. These are not the only ones we are thinking about. We're actively thinking about newer features to build. So some things like interpolation, gap filling, these are all top of mind. And we would love to hear back if there's anything else that you want us to build. Um, so with that, I would want, like to pass it on to Brian Lenker, who is the uh, field CTO for financial services to show us a demo of how all of these would work together for financial services. Thanks, Yogita. I'm really excited to show this demo today of a lot of the functions that you just described and how we can really just bring together all this functionality into a seamless workflow. So what I'm starting with here is a notebook that's going to go through a series of these function calls relating this to some tick data that we have for our marketplace. But first, I need to go actually grab this tick data. So let me hop over to the Snowflake marketplace. I'm going to quickly search for tick. And we'll have a lot of results come back, but I'm really interested in this first this first one here. This is actually from one of our data providers called FactSet. 
and they have a great free data set out here uh, with some tick data in it. It's not a gigantic data set in terms of the number of securities or the histories, but it's it's just enough for us to kind of prove out um, how some of these functions work. Um, so I'm going to click this get button, bring this into my Snowflake account. And just like that, we have access to a huge database, um, even though it's only for a few companies. So let me come back over to my notebook and I will kick this off. Just going to give this a, a second here to run. Um, but while it's doing that, I can run through some of these, these first few cells here. Um, so this first one was bringing in a few packages that we need. So things like Streamlit for some UI components, uh, Pandas for data frame, um, and so on. So nothing crazy here, just kind of setting up in some of our initial packages that we need. This next piece, let's take a look at what's actually in some of this data. Um, so we're, we're not bringing back the entire database here. We're just grabbing the first 100 rows, and we're just grabbing data for meta for one day. And we're just bringing back um, message type zero as in actual trades. Um, so there's obviously a lot more a lot more data in here, but we're just trying to limit down here what we're, we're seeing just to get a feel for it. Um, so you can see we have our ticker. We have dates and times. These are actually an integer, so we're going to change these later, as well as sequences. And then you can see we have our price volumes, cumulative volumes, um, some messages, some trade conditions, pretty much some of the expected you know, data points that we'd expect to see with this content. Um, so I said we were going to deal with the, the day and times. So this is what this next cell is doing. Um, so we're just turning this into essentially a Snowflake timestamp. So it's easy to work with with all of these functions. Um, so you can see here we have about 35 million uh, trades listed for, for Meta um, with the, the content uh, formatted correctly. All right, so let's get into some of these some of these pieces here. First thing that we would often want to see is pull back a price as of a specific time or the closest price. Um, so this is a, a real simple function call, not necessarily any any true time series functions here, just using our, our new timestamp to come out and grab what the price was at a certain time. But now let's look at some of the, the functions that Yogitha was referring to, and let's start with time slice. Uh, so these are, are great, like she mentioned, for providing aggregates, averages, sums, and so forth over um, certain periods. So in this case, we're actually pulling the weekly average price with the total volume over that time frame. And so you can see here, it's the beginning. This is our timestamp that we're starting the calculation from. You can see what the average price is over that time, as well as total volume. Now we can, we're doing this weekly, but we can do the same thing over different time periods as well, which we'll get to. But here's a real quick streamlet chart of what that average price looks like. Um, so this, we'll use these types of features later on in the demo to highlight trade price versus closing prices and so on. But as we get down here into some of these other examples, we can do a similar average, um, but we can look at it over the month. Um, we can also go into a, a tighter time frame and look at it by hour. So depending on the type of analysis you're looking at and you're trying to compare how your trade's doing versus a period of time, these can be really instrumental in, in making these calculations really simple, fast, and easy to use. Like you have said, a lot of this was historically done using window functions and other more complicated syntax. So this is, as you can tell from the, the query, extremely easy to use just by using the simple time slice function. Okay, let's get into some transaction cost analysis. And one of the other functions that you'll get to mention, the as of join. Okay, so first thing we're gonna do for transaction cost analysis is have a benchmark price that we use that we wanna use to compare trades. So we'll do this in two different ways. Now in this first example, we're actually just gonna grab the closing prices, essentially the 4 p.m. price for uh, Meta across all the dates that we have. Um, so that's what this first calculation is doing, um, just grabbing our closing prices. Now the next one is where the real work happens. And you can see here, we're basically joining the trades data that we brought in from the beginning. Here's our meta trades, joining it to our closing prices. And we're just basically lining up the timestamps. Again, this syntax is incredibly easy to use. Um, it just makes calling this information so much easier. So what you can see here in our final results is we have our timestamp, what our trade price was, what the closing price was, and essentially what the difference between those two is, essentially that what we're calling here the price impact. And so now that we have this price impact, we can start analyzing all of these price impacts um, just to, to see what kind of, for example, what distribution looks like um, across the whole bunch of different metrics, um, you know, versus our um, you know, average trade price, closing prices, um, cumulative price impact, and so on. So let's take a let's take a look at a couple at a couple examples down here. Um, so first one that we want to look at 
is what our trade price looks like versus the market price over time. Um, so real quick chart, just to see graphically what the difference looks like as we're, we're going through time. And you can see it, it's pretty close, but there are definitely some impacts in here and some differences. So let's, let's dig into those a bit more. So the first one that we're looking at here is basically a scatter plot that shows the price impact of trades over time. So each point here is showing that price impact of the trade with basically the plot trying to help identify um, any type of trends that we're seeing. Um, so anything that's above the line is, you know, a, essentially a, a positive price impact might indicate bullish sentiment or maybe even aggressive buying, whereas the inverse would be true for those below zero. Um, we can also look for, for specific densities in here um, to see if there's, you know, a, a lot of clustering that's happening. This actually looks pretty, pretty spread out. Um, so I would say there's, there's not really a big, a big, a big impact there from, from density. Now we can look at the same concept, but we can do volume. Um, versus price impact. And this one is just, you know, showing us that, that relationship. Again, each point's representing a trade, the position indicating how that trade volume correlates to the price impact. For the most part, we're seeing pretty lower volumes in here. So b below 0.5 in the, the price impacts ranging from looks like, you know, maybe like negative three up to positive three. This distribution is really showing that, you know, smaller trade volumes are more common and their price impact varies within that range. And you know, for the for the data that we have here, it's it's relatively contained for, for the price impact value. So for this next one, let's take a look at the distribution of these of these price impacts across our trades. First thing that I see here, you know, based on my old stats days, looks very much like our our traditional bell curve, indicating that these price impacts are distributed symmetrically. I would, you know, I would say this pretty much follows a normal distribution. So we're just looking to see if there's any, any big outliers out here, which we do have one, but for the most part, it's pretty much a normal distribution. And then for our, our last quick analysis here, uh, this line chart is showing how the cumulative price impact of trades changes over time. So this red line just indicates the trend in total price impact revealing how it accumulates throughout the trading period. For the most part, everything looks pretty, pretty normal here, except for we had, we had one big hop in, in later October. So that's all looking at transaction cost analysis versus you know, our trades versus the closing price for the day. Now we can look at this as an alternative way of looking at it a different benchmark value. So in this case, what we can use is we can use the BBO price within a certain window of the trade happening. So in this case, we can, we can show it, you know, say within like a thousand milliseconds of the trade happening. So for this, instead of using the full trade list for for Meta, um, we actually just created our own little trades database here, just showing a couple of trades that are happening throughout the day for different block sizes executed at different prices. So that's what we'll use for our trades data. And then for our actual benchmark price, um, we'll use that, that BBO price with a, a time add-on here of 1,000 milliseconds. So here you can see essentially the different values in here, what our trade price was, um, what the mid was as well as the mark out with our with our trade size in here. And so really what we're trying to get from this is, you know, what percent are we essentially off by when it comes to our trades versus that benchmark? And so we have a, a real quick calc here. So we're about 1.1% different versus what the accepted trade value would be. Maybe if you're looking at something over 2%, it might be egregious in terms of the differences, but really we're, we're, we're pretty close to what the BBO value is. So just another example of how we could calculate transaction cost analysis with a, with a different benchmark. Now, in these next few use cases here, we're going to show off some of the, the range-based functions. Um, so this is, is really just valuable for helping us see some of the short-term price movements. And this range function really just helps us do that in a lot easier way. So for this example here, um, we can really use this for, for moving averages, which is really just a, a fantastic way, an easy way to calculate this. So in this case we can show essentially for each interval that we're choosing here, what the average price is over that period and what the average volume is. Um, so in this case, we're kind of bringing it up from the microsecond or nanosecond level up to the, the minute level and calculating what those are over the periods. Now we can do the same thing we can do in this case, in this next one, we're doing a more of a 10 minute moving average. So we get something a bit more call like full for the, for the windowing period. Um, so again, super easy to use. Um, you can see what our what our functions here look like calling this range between um, and what the what the syntax looks like.
So this next example is how we would calculate a volume weighted average price using and building on top of that 10 minute window. Um, so again, very, very common um, calculation for us to calculate out here, um, but you can see what the results look like below and what the syntax would look like to call it. Very easy to use. And then we can do something similar for a time-weighted average price. So you know, not only do you have all of these different averaging options, volume-weighted average price, but we also have a, a account for time-weighted average price as well. A little bit more of a, of a complicated query, um, but you end up with uh, you know, your calculation at the bottom. And then, of course, what we can do moving down here is um, compare the values between all three, our regular moving averages, our volume-weighted average, and our time-weighted average prices. Um, there is a green bar behind there. You can kind of see it sticking out, but they're, um, they're, all, they're all very close with a, a few exceptions. So a very easy way to calculate all these things efficiently, um, chart them very quickly, and see what the results look like. Now, the last piece that I want to show here for time series functions are the lead and lag window functions. Um, so if you're ever trying to calculate percent change, returns, and, and so forth, like these make it extremely to do so just by essentially grabbing, in this case, um, we're going to grab the previous price in the row. So this timestamp, the price was 196. We want to easily compare it to the price before. Um, it's really easy to do so by using the, the, this function. Um, that's the lag function noted right here. And you can do the, the opposite, which would be the lead function, which would be grabbing the next immediate trade um, using a very similar, a similar syntax. So again, very, very fantastic to use for quick changes in trades. Um, but that is it for the demo. Um, Chris, let me pass it back over to you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you everyone for watching our video. If you have any questions for how to use time series analytics, please do not hesitate to reach out to your account executive or your sales engineer for your Snowflake account. We look forward to bringing you along on this journey. Thank you very much.